It is our hope today that you will put on your innovative, innovator hats and be inspired to action by Tony's message. We welcome Tony Geraci and we start with a short clip from Cafeteria Man. Rock, baby. Tony Jurassic is with us. He's a Baltimore's new director of food nutrition. We got 85,000 kids out there that's looking for a meal every day. This is going to be a model that every state in this country is going to start using to feed their kids local, fresh food. We wanted to have a lunch better because it was disgusting. Focusing on school food reform is at some level essential. Pizza, 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 pizza. And, uh, yeah, pizza. I ate because I was hungry and I had nothing to eat. And I didn't bring lunch every day. Dan PR in Washington, what have you done? There are many of you in this room that will not be back here next year. And you know who you are. Everybody has kids, right? So you think, okay, this is common ground. It's not the case. I spent $2 million to share our fresh fruit. You're saying you're not getting any of it? We don't get any fresh fruit. This is crazy. How you doing, man? Damn paradise, baby. Give him hell. All right. If Tony makes this happen here, I think you'll see this happening all over the country. Cutting these fresh vegetables and fruits organically grown. You can't get them organically grown in the hood because we don't got no grass. Same kids who are already struggling, struggling to eat good meals at home are getting inferior meals at school. There are times that Tony wants to push too fast. I'm not interested in being a bureaucrat. I am just so proud and honored to have you here at the White House. Fresh is good, you guys. Fresh is good. How do we do this? How do we figure this stuff out? We need a recipe for change. Is this film going to make me look fat? chefs. I grew up in a place where food is honored and the traditions of food are honored. Uh, the two most influential cooks in my life were my two grandmothers. Uh, my, uh, my father's mother just uh, celebrated her 101st birthday last Sunday. And uh, she, she knows about the work that I do. And uh, she said, you know, she's an old Sicilian lady, and she said, you know, I think I know how to stop this whole childhood obesity. And I said, get far, Grandma, get far, no. And she said, make them eat their greens and go out and play. <laughs> All right, so simple wisdom around this stuff. So um, look, I, uh, I got involved in child nutrition by accident. I was a, a very, very successful restaurateur. And uh, I raised my kids uh, in a small community in southern New Hampshire. Uh, and I had kind of a catastrophic, life-changing accident in my life. And uh, um, the school district that I raised my kids in came to me and they said, look, um, you're a chef, you're a food guy, you're a businessman, you know a lot about this stuff. Uh, we don't want to be a chicken nugget factory anymore. Help us, help us to change. So uh, I took this job as a food service director in a small, uh, small community and um, I thought, how hard can it be, right, you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been running multi-million dollar restaurants for a while. How hard could this be? Well, I figured out it was really hard, all right? Uh, and it uh, amazed me that the few resources that food service directors have to feed kids nutritious, appropriate meals. And uh, I learned a lot from these lunch ladies. I'm proud to say I'm a lunch lady. And uh, um, so, so we sort of began at the beginning there. Um, I helped found the uh, New Hampshire Farm to School Network, and uh, again, by accident, I was driving down the road, and I'm on my cell phone screaming at my produce guy about my apples. Where the hell are my apples? I need eight bushels of apples every day to feed my kids in their garden. I kept dropping the cell call, right? So I pulled off to the side of the road, and I realized I'm parked in the middle of an apple orchard. <laughs> so I walk up the road, there's this lady pet 
Peg McLeod who's sorting apples, and she has this big pile of palm-sized apples and a smaller pile of larger commercial-style apples. And I asked her about the apples, and she said, look, um, the little apples aren't a viable commercial apple, so we, you know, crush them into cider and use them for pig feed or whatever, and the big apples we sell at the stand. And I thought, my vans drive by here every day delivering food. Why aren't I buying local apples? So, um, so I said, look, I, I'd like to buy all of those little apples because little apples, little hands, little kids, you know, all kind of work together for me. So, uh, and she teared up a little bit, and I didn't understand it at the time. And uh, her husband, John, uh, was the former president of the New England uh, Fruit Growers Association, uh, was in the final stages of Alzheimer's disease. And this fifth generation family farm uh, was about to go away because property in New England uh, is often worth more in housing developments than they are in family farms. But through this uh, collaborative effort that we put together that we were able to uh, create a contract that uh, ensured her sustainability as a family farm. Uh, and I'm happy to say that um, uh, you know, it's still a family farm. I went back to my office and I called the other food service directors in the state and I said, hey, uh, do you guys have like orchards in your towns? And they said, yeah. I said, are you buying apples from them? And they said, no. I said, why? So look, within eight months, we had New Hampshire apples served to New Hampshire kids every day. And this continues to happen. This is like six years later, all right? And it's because, look, Rather than building expressways to ship your money out of your state and out of, out of your community, why not actively create off-ramps to keep the money here, all right? For every dollar that you spend in your local community, it flips 10 times before it leaves. That's the economic impact of spending a dollar in your town. So, uh, um, you know, our program was great, successful. I started working with the food service directors uh, and the uh, former chief of staff of the New York City Public Schools uh, program, uh, Dr. Antonio Andres Alonso, became the new superintendent of Baltimore City Public Schools. He's from Cuba, uh, and he's a brilliant educator, uh, and he was the first administrator that I had ever met that connected nutrition with education. Like, he understood that it would be unrealistic to put his teachers in front of kids that weren't ready to learn. So how do you spend billions of dollars on public education and then fill the room full of kids that are hungry or jacked up on sugar? You're wasting the money. Teachers, much like chefs, are very passionate about what they do. They became teachers because they want to teach. They don't want to be proctors. They don't want to be disciplinarians. They want to teach. So if they're spending half their day dealing with you know, behavioral issues, they don't get their job done. Our kids don't learn the lessons, and we have poor test scores, right? Kind of a little thing. So, uh, so they invited me down. I'm a really good businessman. I'm a very successful businessman. Uh, and they uh, asked me to come down and uh, lay out my business plan on how I would feed 86,000 kids every day uh, nutritious meals. So, it, you know, somebody said, like, Fall River is about 80,000 people, right? So imagine feeding that city every single day, breakfast, lunch, snack, maybe something else. You know, it's, you know, logistically, it's pretty, you know, daunting. So I laid out my business plan. And I'm in this room full of all the suits, right? The suits are going, well, it'll never work, you know. You know, it's just too hard. The bureaucracy won't, uh, won't allow this to happen. Uh, and then I thought I heard Dr. Alonzo mumble under his breath. He said, then I will kill the bureaucracy. <laughs> so he and then I go home. Christmas Eve, I get this, uh, I get this email, right? This cryptic email to a link to the Baltimore Sun. And Baltimore Sun headlines, I open it up, Baltimore Sun headline opens up, and it says, uh, it says, uh, you know, Dr. Alonzo fires 230 bureaucrats in Baltimore City. And then uh, there was a little note that said, do you still want the job? <laughs> so of course I do. So we can go to the next slide. This is the amazing Dr. Antonio Alonso. Right? <laughs> so look, all of this begins with visionary leadership. It begins every single person in this room right now is a leader. It was very purposeful that you were invited to this meeting, 
all right, because of your leadership. You know, one of the hard things of leadership is leading, beginning the conversation, you know, keeping the message up front and driving. So, so it's critical that you have great leadership to accomplish these things. So, uh, next slide. All right. So, um, so our kids. So, I, I'm 86,000 kids, right? Uh, and all of them qualified for free breakfast, right? I created this universal free breakfast program. But on our best days, we were feeding 8,500 kids. How do you change that? So I'm a chef, right? I go and I cook from my pantry, right? You know, so uh, you know I learned that from my grandmother. So I open the doors of my pantry and I look inside and I say, what do I have? And what I had in my pantry were birds. I had Baltimore Ravens and Baltimore Orioles. All right, those were the birds that I had in my pantry. And I went to those guys and I said, look, help me, help me to feed my kids. Uh, and it was very purposeful in that I asked them to collaborate with me. A couple of reasons, right? One, these professional athletes did not become professional athletes by accident. It was very purposeful <laughs> in their life that they got to that place. Two, I wanted a role model that emulated success. Uh, the guy rolling through the neighborhood in a Lexus with a trunk full of cocaine, that story is the same way. Every time, every city, in every place. There's no deviation from the ending of that. But these professional athletes, when their athletic careers end, often they go back to being engineers and entrepreneurs and, and uh, business people and things that they studied for uh, in their collegiate career. All right? So there's life after athletics. And I wanted my kids to understand that. And then the final thing was, I wanted my kids to understand that there was a direct connection between nutrition and performance, whether it was academic performance or physical performance, that we are machines and we require fuel to do the things that we do. So uh, we created this thing called Breakfast in Birdland, right? So the school that had the best breakfast participation uh, got to have breakfast with the Ravens and the Orioles and their mascots and their trainers and their nutritionists. Uh, and it was amazing, right? And then we took it a step further and we said, what about breakfast in the classroom? <coughs> Um, and that's why I created these little breakfast boxes, right? So the little breakfast boxes inside has, has the lowest sugar cereal on the market, 100% juice, and a whole grain snack that didn't have dyes or preservatives in it, and we served it with a carton of milk, and they were shelf-stable, so we could move them around the district. Uh, they work great for grab-and-go for high school kids, because high school kids, I don't know if you know, it's a social faux pas to hang out in the cafeteria, right? So don't try it. It doesn't work, but waste your money, figure out ways to get the food to them. And then uh, uh, Baltimore's a union town, right? And uh, I had uh, my, uh, my janitorial staff and my legislators say, it's not in our contract. And I said, okay. So I went to the kids, and I took the oldest group of kids in every school, and I said, you're in my breakfast club. So again, I grew up in New Orleans, I went to Jesuit, right? And uh, I secretly lusted after the hall monitor sash, right? Because it was an outward sign of respect and nobility, something I did not possess, right? And, uh, and I thought, why not give our kids some responsibilities? Look, we have an expectation that they're going to be good citizens, but we don't give them citizenship skills to home, right? So uh, our oldest group of kids, uh, took the breakfast into the classroom, picked up the trash, brought it back. We started giving them community service hours for the work that they did, right? And uh, in our school, there was a requirement of so many service hours to graduate, so why not sort of incorporate this thing? And what we found was universally, universally, Little kids could not wait to be older kids to run the breakfast program. And oh, by the way, we went from serving 8,500 breakfasts a day to 45,000 breakfasts a day in less than 60 days. Oh. It's good. Now, the economic, now, the economic impact of that was an additional $12 million of revenue just in breakfast through the reimbursement. Now I got a little money. I got a little money to work with, right? So I'm going to start doing some other stuff. Next slide. So this gentleman sitting down here, his name is uh, Reverend George Bragg. He was born a slave. And uh, uh, he founded this orphanage outside of Baltimore. 
Even though the Emancipation Proclamation had been proclaimed, he understood that his people would never experience freedom, would never experience real freedom until they had economic freedom. And that meant jobs, and careers, and opportunity that up until that point in history did not exist. So uh, he, uh, he founded this place, the Great Kids Farm, and if you look at the little two uh, maps next to it, see that little patch of green right there? That is in the heart of Babylon, right? It is surrounded by strip malls and muffler shops and pizza places. But it's this little piece of green in the middle of Baltimore that was lost. That was an abandoned property. Um, and uh, one of the deals that I made coming to Baltimore was uh, because of my involvement in uh, uh, farms at school and the fact that, look, if you give a kid a seed, and let them plant that seed in the ground, and they watch that grow, and it produces something it, uh, that they can harvest, that they can share with their friends. It forever changes the way they look at food. It's no longer consumption, right? It's a lesson far greater than that. Look, the most power, powerful thing I've ever seen in my life was watching a kid walk down a row of cherry tomatoes that she planted, and she plucked one off the vine, still warm from the summer sun, and she popped it in her mouth, and the flavor exploded, and this glow came over her face. That, look, that is something every child in this country should experience, and that is something that we have the ability to allow them to experience, right? So, anyhow, uh, this little piece of property was, uh, was my little, uh, my starting point. Uh, I needed to have a place where I could start um, reintroducing real food to our kids. Look, we've successfully raised an entire generation of children that think fruit is a flavor. It is a fruity flavor. It's not food, all right? It's something else, all right? So, how do you do that? You've got to reintroduce that. So, uh, so uh, I'm a food educator, and uh, uh, look, I, I was a bad student, right? You, you, you know, I, 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 you know, probably had learning disabilities. You know, uh, my daughter will tell you that I have oppositional defiance disorder. You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm undiagnosed stuff. Uh, but uh, look, I didn't get mad until I started taking apart recipes. Cooking was the thing that connected with me. I, I, I like to cook, right? So when I started taking apart recipes and expanding them, oh, I understood sort of complex math, right? I didn't get chemistry until I saw bread rise. I, I mean, that was the thing that spoke to me. That was the voice that spoke to me. So I'm convinced that our hallways are full of these young Julia Childs and James Beards waiting to hear a voice. And part of education is facilitating a voice, making sure that our kids connect to something. They all learn differently. So, um, so you learn with your eyes and your ears, but you also learn with your mouth. You taste, right? That kid right there, tasting a radish green for the very first time in his life. His expression tells the story. Just as right. important to feed our kids really good food, like, they need to have jobs. They need to have careers when they leave our schools. So um, I made up this word, agro-hospitality, right? Nice made-up word, like making up words. Uh, and it simply means the farm to fork. In all of the industries that are associated between putting the seed in the ground or even planning to put the seed in the ground to putting the fork in your mouth, right? So there's math and there's science and there's technology and logistics and chemistry uh, and agriculture and hospitality and business and management. There's all of these great jobs that are associated with it. Look, um, as a chef, uh, I have had the great privilege to cook from Hartford to Hong Kong in my career um, and I've been able to see the world, literally. I'm a kid who came from the Desire Street Projects in New Orleans to see the world because of my trade, you know? And I think that this is a, a great career path. It is probably the last career path that you can go from uh, the stock room to the boardroom in, you know, without um, additional education, higher education. It always helps, right? But it's also the last probably career path that, you know, a single mom trying to raise her kids uh, can uh, ensure that they're going to get a paycheck every week. 
So it's a it's a wonderful uh, wonderful wonderful career uh, uh, path. Next next slide. So um, so we ground our kids in education, right? And we sort of make everything that we do a teaching moment. The breakfast in the classroom, teaching moment, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the breakfast in the classroom was like, I, I, I put this little secret code inside of each one of the little boxes. One in 20 of the boxes had this secret code, and they won, like, whatever swag, you know? Um, uh, an MP3 player, DVD, music downloads, Orioles hats, Ravens jerseys, whatever swag I could hustle. And I knew that it was kind of Pavlovian that they were tearing open the boxes looking for the prize, right? But eventually they started eating the content of the boxes that sort of changed behavior, that sort of rolled it forward. So we started doing that with, you know, our school gardens and our great kids' farm. So, so I was doing this uh, cooking demo and I asked these kids, I said, so look, go out, to, uh, go out to the garden and bring me some tomatoes and some basil and some carrots. And they came back with some tomatoes and basil. I said, where are the carrots? I said, Chef G, there, there's no carrots out there. I said, no, there's carrots out there. They go, Chef G, we are not stupid. We know there are no carrots out there. Carrots are orange. There's nothing but green out there. So, and I thought, aha. Like, that was the moment. That was the epiphany for me to stop assuming. To stop assuming that kids know where food comes from. And I went out. And those kids are sniffing some carrots. We pulled them up out of the ground, and I said, carrots. <laughs> right? But look, it, 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 it was a big moment for both of us. Uh, and we all sort of went, oh. So now, as I sort of approach, um, um, like, food education and education around this, like, I stopped assuming. And I started, you know, trying to get right back to the basics on this thing. So, it's very cool, and, and, and it's all a teachable moment, you know? Go ahead. So, um, so these are microgreens, trays of microgreens. So um, I grow microgreens because I can get like three or four harvests a month. Uh, microgreens are nutritionally at their densest uh, at that moment of being like a little microgreen, uh, and uh, they taste really intense. Uh, and uh, the rock star chefs in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore want them, right? So I do custom blends for those guys, um, and uh, it's just, you know, that, uh, that was our first revenue stream. Those uh, three kids there, uh, blue shirt, striped shirt, orange shirt, uh, those are the kids that kind of started the revolution in Baltimore. Um, you heard a little bit of, uh, on the clip, like they called me up, they said, Chef T, our food sucked. And I said, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, and uh, well, what can we do about it? And I said, well, look, you need to advocate for yourself. You need to start talking about this thing. So they actually um, created a um, cafeteria bill of rights. And the bill of rights simply said, we have the right to real food. We have the right to have it prepared. Uh, we have a responsibility to eat the food that's being served to us because there are many that, do, that don't have access to food, right? Uh, and they took the uh, school lunch down to the school board one night and flipped the tray over and nothing fell off. And they said, try some. <laughs> Nobody on the school board was willing to eat lunch that day. But it began a conversation. It began this conversation around, we need to change, we need to fix, we need to do something about that. And those three kids, I uh, had an opportunity uh, when, uh, when the um, Child Nutrition Reauthorization uh, Act was being debated in Congress. Uh, it was the first time in American history that American children got to testify before Congress about a law that directly affected them. It was a powerful moment. And it was like personally and professionally living through a schoolhouse rock episode, you know, <laughs> seeing this happen. Uh, and uh, their faces when they realized how much power they have. But these kids that we're talking about right now, 20 years from now are going to be deciding how you live, how you choose to die, who you choose to marry, what your world is going to be about. And if you are not willing to step up to the plate today and do the right thing, what is your expectation? This is real stuff, you guys. Next slide. So uh, a brand new approach, right? So my approach is fresher is better, right? You, you know, I learned that as a restaurateur. I learned that if I provided my clients with the best possible food, that they would keep coming back to my restaurant uh, and, 
you know, the cash registers kept ringing and people had jobs and life was good. So um, I applied that um, in child nutrition and how I did that first was with peaches in Baltimore, right? Uh, so uh, I lived it on, on my sailboat when, when, when I was in Baltimore. We have a um, uh, 36 uh, and a half foot catch that I lived in the harbor, right? And I, uh, um, uh, I got off the boat and uh, I went online I found sort of this, this website called Maryland's Vast and it listed all of the farms in Maryland and I drove out to this farm, the Boggers Farm. Uh, and I met this guy, Les Dietz, right? And I uh, uh, told him, uh, you know, I'm the new food service director and, you know, I'd like to see what you guys have and maybe we can incorporate some of this good fresh stuff into uh, our menu. And uh, very skeptical, you know, and uh, so we spent that whole day driving around his pickup truck over this 850-acre farm. And uh, we went from field to field, and orchard to orchard, and he told me what happened in that field, in that orchard, 25 years before, 50 years before, 100 years before, 150 years before. And I realized this was not just a piece of dirt, all right, that this was his family's legacy that his family had invested their lives, uh, their careers, their fortune, and their bounty in this little small piece of dirt, right? Uh, so doing business with me uh, needed to be personal, right? And that's kind of how I do business. So we went back to uh, the packing shed, and they were running peaches at the time, right? Uh, and I said, Les, I want you to pick every piece of fruit off the tree. I don't need stickers. I don't need special boxes. I don't need special handling. You know, he's he's a, uh, he's a farmer who was practicing sort of you know gap rules, which is you know uh, um, what is it like good agriculture practices, right? But yet not gap certified, right? Um, but uh, you know, nice clean operation. I said, look, I want you to put those peaches in a wooden crate and take the wooden crates and ship to my warehouse. From my warehouse, I'll send them to my schools and I'll wash the peaches and I'll feed them to my kids and then I'll take the empty wooden crates and we send back to the warehouse. When you drop off the next load, you back all the empties and you bring me good stuff and we keep doing this until I run out of money or you run out of fruit. And we went from peaches to nectarines to apples to pears we ran that through, like, you know, up, up through almost March, you know, with, with, with the abundance that was there. He also realized that he couldn't totally supply me. Look, when I serve peaches for lunch, for one serving for one day, it's 40,000 pounds of peaches. A lot of peaches, all right? But he, his neighbor grew peaches, and this other farm grew peaches, and pretty soon they're all sort of pooling their resource together. And look, we, we worked out a deal where I could buy peaches from them for eight cents a piece, or I could buy USDA canned peaches packed in corn syrup that traveled 2,200 miles to get to my warehouse for 14 cents a portion. What made more sense, you know? And the thing for me that really clinched it was this notion that, well, no, my very first day on the job as the food service director, I'm at this little school called Lockerman Bundy School, right? It's a, it's a poor little school on the west side. And I'm sitting there with these three semi-toothed second graders, right? One, you know, forget how tiny second graders are. And one kid is just robbing a peach along the space. And I said, it's supposed to be like that. And another kid is like breathing into this peach. And it's supposed to smell like that. And the third kid is biting into this peach, and the juice is running down his face, and his big smile is coming over his face, and it's supposed to taste like that. And it was the first time in their lives that they had had the experience of tasting a peach. But again, we assume this stuff happens everywhere. In many of our cities, children live in food deserts where food is not accessible. Real food is not accessible. So uh, that was my approach. And look, uh, we helped create legislation that required Baltimore City Public Schools to only buy from Maryland farms. In our very first year, we spent $2.3 million on local produce. I could have spent $6 million, but that $2.3 million, flipping 10 times, that's a $23 million a year impact in the community. So start 
looking beyond the box. Start looking beyond that moment. Next slide. So, uh, so this great kid's farm, right? So I knew that, um, one, I didn't get any money, right? My boss is very generous. He said, you can have the, you can have the land, but we don't have money. I said, okay. It's a great story, right? Uh, but I knew that, look, I, I can build this. Uh, and I can build it because there's a community out there, right? So, so I always sort of think in cooking metaphors because that's, you know, again, not so smart, so that's how I have to sort of process stuff. So look, I, I, I liken a community to gumbo. Anybody here know what gumbo is? So gumbo is this amazing elixir, right? This great seasonal stew that is made up of all of these unlikely ingredients. And if you have duck, you have duck gumbo. If you have alligator, you have alligator gumbo. If you have chicken, it's chicken gumbo. But whatever you have goes in the pot and it becomes gumbo, right? And uh, uh, sometimes, um, it's like that guy, right? He, 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 he came into the village and the village was starving and he had the big pot of water and he filled it with water and he dropped a rock in it, right? And he's standing there stirring this pot of water with a rock and they go, what, what, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm making stone soup. It's, uh, it's really good. You know, it's a uh, rock in, with some water. And they say, well, you know, it would be better if we had other stuff. And, you know, well, you know, I have an onion. He threw an onion in. Somebody else had a potato and then there were some carrots and some turnips and a chicken and pretty soon this pot is full of all this stuff that created this nutritionally dense stew that fed this village that they were no longer starving to death, right? It, communities are like that. Every community is the same. We have, you know, nurses and doctors and plumbers and carpenters and electricians and mechanics and every community has resources and it's about tying into those resources. But for you guys, because you guys are leaders, you're pot stirrers. You guys need to start stirring the pot and start talking about what you need to get thrown into that pot, right? To, to, to facilitate the projects that you're doing. So, um, um, so it takes the community to build a farm. So, you know, we all sort of join together with our collective skills uh, to do things. The electricians rewired, plumbers replumbed, carpenters built, you know, um, you know gardeners gardened. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the kids came, and uh, our Great Kids Farm, there's a reason why it's called Great Kids Farm, because it's about our kids, right? Uh, even though they don't look like farmers, they are amazing urban farmers. They were there in the middle of the very first snowstorm of the season <coughs> to uh, build um, a containment area for the goats that I was about to bring in, right? So, uh, you know, I believe in alternative methods of land management and stuff, and I thought, you know, goats are perfect because goats will clear, aerate, fertilize, all without a coffee break or a union grievance, right? You know? So, uh, so this farmer uh, donated, like, this small herd of goats. We had eight goats uh, that we started with, and, uh, you know, we started our farm. Next slide. And of course, our goats. You know, bringing, bringing goats to the Great Kids Farm was like bringing a herd of unicorn there, right? And so people, people had never seen goats in our city, right? And uh, on our first weekend, we had over 200 cars drive through the farm. We're here to see the goats. You know, it's like, okay. You know? Uh, we were really careful to put the goats away at night, too, so they didn't become goat curry the next day. So, you know. So anyhow, next slide. Uh, so this is how a farm evolves. Uh, you sort of begin at the beginning and uh, you know you work through the process and uh, you plan uh, and it, 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 it takes form and it take, takes shape in a way that uh, you know you don't really expect it to. And the goats keep uh, chewing our chickens, our bees, you know, and uh, you know we, 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 we were able to sort of create this, you know, uh, self-sustaining business model uh, over the course of a year. All right, you can go back. Uh, go up. Yeah, next. Anyhow, you want to stop on that earth oven. Um, so um, it was all of this cool stuff, and it was all these uh, great people that got involved to sort of get this thing off the ground. All right, there we go. So um, 
teaching environments. You know, it's it, it's about a lot of things. It's you know, art and language and math and science and all this stuff. And uh, so this is a uh, you know, my kids like pizza, right? I said I like pizza too. And uh, this group of hippie kids came to me and said, Chef G, we could build earth oven. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so they came and they laid out this big blue tarp and they went down to the river and they started grabbing mud and some straw and they all set up their little drum circle and they started drumming <laughs> and the kids started dancing in the mud and the straw and then they started kind of free forming this thing. So these earth ovens exist all over the planet. Like virtually every planet. Uh, every culture on the planet has bread in their cuisine, with maybe the exception of Inuits. You know, I think blubber is the end all, the be all there, right? But um, so, um, and they're supposed to be done with these like like dense sort of stone bases, like granite or something like that. Well, we don't have granite; we have a lot of busted up concrete. So, uh, so I told my kids, we're going to build cars out of a very special stone that only grows in Baltimore. It's called urbanite, right? And, uh, so it's all busted up stone. Um, but look, these kids like freeformed and built this great earth oven, and we planted a grow your own pizza garden next to this oven. And the kids like literally would go pick eggplants and peppers and and basil and tomatoes and create their own pizzas outside by themselves, start to finish. It was this vertically integrated experience of like planting it, harvesting it, growing it, serving it, cooking it, eating it. Pretty cool stuff. Change the way you think. Next slide. So paying the bills. So how do you do all this stuff, right? So you've got. So I'm a businessman. I know that I've got to pay the bills to get there, right? Um, so this is one of three um, greenhouses that were um, on the property. They no glass, so you know we got local glass guys to do it. Um, it's funny when when we first got the property, we had to clear it. There's just a lot of trash and junk there, and uh, we needed wheelbarrows. We didn't have wheelbarrows. This kid, yeah. He came up to me and said, Chef G, don't worry about the wheelbarrows. And I said, okay. <laughs> and the next day I showed up and the parking lot was full of Home Depot shopping carts. <laughs> understand your food system, do something about it, care about it, and care about those people that you work with that are part of the food system as well as yourself. So thanks, Tony.